Our first scripture reading for today comes from the Psalms. We'll be in Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. It reads, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever, and they are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Continuing our Lenten journey, we're in the Gospel of Matthew. This season, we're going to read the parable of the sower together. It's in chapter 13, the first nine verses. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And this is the word of God. So we do continue our Lenten journey today, looking at the teaching sections of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. So this part that we're in today is known as the parable discourse. Parables are stories told by Jesus in order to make a point, um, to illustrate something for us. And you know, Jesus had this gift of engaging people through the telling of a story. So we heard in our, re- in our reading you know, that Jesus was teaching and telling them many things through the telling of these parables. Today, we're going to concentrate on one particular parable, the parable of the sower. You know, so the sower goes to do what a sower does, um, his work of sowing. By your answers to Miss Norma's jam time, um, a lot of you understand the work of the sower because you had all the answers. Um, but as he's scattering, you know, some of the seeds drop and they fall along the path, but the birds come and eat them. Some of them are on rocky ground where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang to life quickly, but they couldn't take much. Like any time anything was introduced, they they had no roots and they died. So when the sun came up, they were scorched and they perished. Other seeds fell on the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. But others fell on the good soil. And they brought forth grain of all differing amounts. And Jesus told them, let anyone who has ears listen. So, you know, a few verses later, Jesus goes on to explain this parable. He tells us what each situation means. He says, when anybody hears the word of the kingdom of God and they don't understand it, and, you know, I think more, you know, in that is, you know, we're not seeking to understand it that the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. You know, that what was sown on the path gets taken away. So there's something to begin with, and it talks about what is sown in the heart, but it talks about in this instance, it's snatched away, and it's the evil one doing the snatching. You know, so Jesus goes on to explain the rocky ground, that this is the one who hears the word and immediately is filled with joy. And there is excitement, but there's no roots growing in this situation. So it's only able to endure for a little while. 
And when trouble arises, and at some point there's always trouble, you know, on account of the word, that person like falls away immediately. They don't know how to handle it. So with the thorns, there's the one that hears the word, but cares about what the world is offering more. And it chokes out the the word and it yields nothing. But Jesus says that what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who bears fruit and yields in differing degrees things that come out of that good soil. So I think part of the great news of this is that we're not handed one set of seeds and that's it. It's not like you have to stand in line and you get handed a pot and that's what you have, no refunds, exchanges. Um, You know, there might be none for you or a little for you and you get the good soil. You know, that in every instance in this parable, there is seeds, there's something there that is given to all of us in differing moments of our lives. So then we try to make sure that we're creating space for God's good soil to be in us, to nurture that soil that's been planted. Um, And now that we're aware of the seeds that are given to us, you know, that how we treat them and how we respond to them. You know, so that we have to guard from the things that will rob us from what we find in the Word. That we find ways to grow our strength in our faith and in our community of faith. You know, especially for when times are rough or for when we're afraid, when we're uncertain, when we don't know what the future holds, and when everyone around us is full of fear. That we're reminded not to lose sight of God to hold our focus on what we know to be true. You know, we can fill ourselves with good soil in so many ways, you know, immersing ourselves always in the word of God so we can recognize what's of God and what's not of God. You know, that God's promises give us hope and give us comfort. God's promises give us conviction and God's promises give us direction. You know, that we pray, you know, when we're on our own and that we pray together and that we're part of a worshiping community, whatever that looks like, right? Because right now we don't know what that's going to look like. Lots of churches meeting online this week. Um, and that, that may be where we go for a few weeks, but that we're still connected. We're still part of a worshiping community. We still walk the journey with each other. You know, that we all learn from each other and we continue to grow in our faith. So there are so many examples of what it looks like when good soil is in place. And I want to share just a few with you. So if you didn't pick up on it when the Harriet movie was in town, I have a great respect for Harriet Tubman. You know, I looked up some of the notes I took on one of my trips through the new visitor center in Cambridge, which is absolutely worth the the trip. And, you know, when one person was writing about her, One of her contemporaries, they said, I never met with any person of any color who had more confidence in the voice of God. That is an incredible compliment. And it says, as spoken direct to her soul and her faith in a supreme power truly was great. That she talked to God on a regular basis. People talked about her intellect and ability to reason and her faith. You know, that she talked about finding her freedom. I had reasoned this out in my mind that there was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. And if I could not have one, I would have another, for no person was going to take me alive. You know, that along her journey, it wasn't enough to stop when she had her freedom. She spent the rest of her life in one way, shape, or form caring for others. She made about a dozen trips into danger to rescue family and friends and bring them to to freedom. And she said, I prayed to God to make me strong and able to fight. And that's what I've prayed for ever since. You know, that she saw how God enabled the work she did, even when it wasn't easy, and that she always provided for others in need, sharing what she had. You know, at 80 years old, 
She fulfilled another dream of hers and opened a home for the aged. You know, we look at her life and we would say, you know, that's evidence of good soil. You know, I look at the work of Jimmy Carter, and I'm talking, you know, I'm not talking politics, I'm talking about in his everyday life, and his commitment to Habitat for Humanity, that in his 90s, he is still at work sites for Habitat. You know, a couple years ago, he was sent to the hospital for dehydration, and he sends a message out from his hospital bed telling him to keep working, to keep drinking water, but to keep working. And when he's released, he shows up at the job site. You know, that he's been working with Habitat for more than three decades. You know, that it is something he feels galled to. And to me, that's evidence of good soil. You know, today we think about what we pledge in baptism as parents, as a congregation, as family. That in essence, what we're pledging and promising is to provide good soil for this child to grow strong and come to a place where they can make a decision for themselves because they have been nurtured in faith and cultivated and grown. So, you know, winter lunches and providing for the shelter and taking care of our school children, finding ways to encourage each other when we're struggling um, is all evidence of good soil. Being an encourager or being a prayer warrior is evidence of good soil. Sitting with someone who is hurting or grieving or struggling is evidence of good soil. I always have to be careful because I think it can sound like I am preaching a works-based faith. And, you know, all that we have is a gift from God. And comes from the grace of God. You know, we don't earn anything from God. But that we are given the good soil that is in us. And the love of God and the love of neighbor. And when it takes root in us, it manifests itself in the way we live our lives. You know, that you should be able to see it. In James chapter 2, it says, Faith without works is dead. That there is a correlation that when we have faith... It produces things within us. So a couple weeks ago, we heard the warning about the false prophet whose words might sound good, but we were able to know them by their actions, that their words and their actions don't match. And when it's good soil that is within us and the love of Christ that is growing in us, you know, there's automatically good fruit that's growing Um, You know, that I don't know how the love of Christ can be in us and not in some sort of way show itself through the gifts we've been given. You know, so we strive to find our passion, the thing God has made important to us, and then we live it in our lives all the time. You know, find the thing that you're willing to even face adversity for. You know, that it, it calls us to be outwardly focused and to truly see each other. So our reading warns us of falling in love with the things of the world. You know, that, that so often, and I think on display in some places in this past week, you know, that the world's going to tell you to look out for number one yourself. Nobody else is going to, Right. Um, but it's okay to take stuff out of people's grocery carts because you, you want it and there's no more on the shelf. Um, you know, that, that there is stuff all around us. Um, but Jesus is going to call us to look out for each other when it's hard and sometimes when we want to give up and when others tell you that it's not going to make a difference or it doesn't make sense, that we keep hearing that voice of Christ that calls us to see each other. So may we hear the teachings of this parable, hear how they relate to what we've learned in the teaching sessions we've covered so far out of the Gospel of Matthew, and may we be caring for the soil and the seeds that are planted in each and every one of us, focusing on the one who makes it good soil. May we seek to be marked by mercy and hope and grace and compassion and love, the presence of the heart of Christ alive on this earth, and the hands and feet of Christ among us. May it be so.